communism is a pipe dream. Well, social justice is a pipe dream in the capital S, capital J, like, you know, Lindsay and, and Helen Pluckrose write in their book. That kind of social justice is also a pipe dream because the actual problems themselves that they're identifying aren't real. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mind Matters. Uh, today, we're going to be launching off from our previous show on uh, detailing, you know, where we detailed all of the uh, kind of the groundwork that you would need in order for us to get into this episode without having to do a lot of explication on the kind of uh, individuals that we'll be discussing and the ways in which they uh, act and manipulate. Uh, so if there's anything that you kind of need more background on, feel free to go back to uh, that previous episode or any of the other episodes that we've done on political ponderology uh, would also be good as well. Um, so for this one, what we're going to be talking about is the rollout of global tyranny uh, that is currently ongoing and is sure to ramp up uh, now that he who shall not be named has been sworn in. Um, so on that note, um, where would where do you guys want to start off? Well, I want to start with a little reminiscence. For some reason, when I was a teenager, I liked uh, like utopian and dystopian fiction. So I read, you know, Brave New World, nineteen eighty four, and a bunch of other ones, some Kafka, and I guess that. That kind of, and 1984 is probably one of my favorite novels ever, um, regardless of genre. And I think that kind of prepared my mind for a lot of the interests that I had in my 20s and now in my 30s. And that's, I guess, one of the reasons why political ponderology, um, like, appealed to me, is because it was about the, the kind of things that I was interested in on a kind of unconscious level, and and increasingly more conscious as I actually started reading more in depth about these sort of things. So not just novels, but history and um, philosophy and things that actually are directly relevant to the stuff that Orwell was writing about in particular. And so when Ponderology came around, I read it and, and was kind of struck by, oh, wow, you know, this this is an explanation for all the things that were kind of left kind of nebulous and well, like Lobachevsky himself says in um, one of the introductory chapters, the reading just regular books about these kind of topics kind of, if you're looking for an actual explanation, it'll leave you kind of dissatisfied. Um, if you're reading a political science book, it's going to be limited to a political Know, political science interpretation of history and oftentimes that will be um, either limited to economics or just pure geopolitics and doesn't really explain what's going on and then if you've got literary descriptions like novels maybe like darkness at noon by uh, Arthur Kessler or or the accounts of like people in concentration camps or the gulag very descriptive and and uh, interesting in their own right and and edifying, but again, doesn't really explain it. You can get an idea of what was going on and and the the kind of depth of suffering, and you can see the outlines of of what was going on. But again, without a without a, an adequate explanation to satisfy the the drive in you that looks for uh, like a cause looks for an actual a rational and coherent explanation of how things actually play out so ponderology provided that and putting all those kind of interests together as scary sometimes as it is it's also kind of like um oh wow we get to watch this play out in in real time now and we got a, a hint of that with the rise of isis in you know syria and iraq where you saw this kind of a, a textbook example from Ponderology of the rise of a, a totally like pathocratic state out of nowhere. And, uh, but, you know, that was never going to last. It was kind of like 
too in your face and too conveniently strategically placed in in the crosshairs of um, American and NATO interests in the region. It's like that was that was never never going to go very far. But still, it was um, an interesting like uh, phenomenon to watch grow. And like I said, now we're seeing what seems to be the the rise of a similar sort of ideology and um, resulting authoritarianism, soft totalitarianism, in the countries in which you know, we live. So it is a an, a great learning opportunity, and it's kind of like, um, you know, instead of just reading about it, you get to live it, and... <laughs> And while it might end horribly, um, you know, hey, at least you got to to watch it happen, having been kind of prepared for it. Because I can't, I can't imagine what it would be like to not have been prepared for it. And what I mean by that, I watched uh, just a clip from uh, this video that's been on YouTube for a while about this uh, this ex KGB guy that defected like to the U.S. in 1970 mm-hmm. or something, and the interviews from the 80s, and he's talking about the you know the the Marxist Leninist plot to to infiltrate and subvert subvert American culture and the different phases it goes through and and he was talking about the um what what Nicholas uh, Taleb calls the intellectual but I- intellectual but idiots or yet idiots and what uh, James Lindsay calls very smart people uh, basically the intellectuals who are just uh, um, I, in a sense, so open-minded that they let the the, the most idiotic ideas in. Um, so all of these, either pro-communist or um, you know fellow traveler or people who who kind of will get on board with the got on board with the communist ideology all throughout the you know the period of the Cold War, and he made the observation that. Nothing's going to change these mi- their minds. Not just the intellectuals, but um, the the students and all the people getting on board with socialist or communist ideology back then. And nothing's going to change their mind. You can present them with facts and figures and evidence, and you can even take them over to to Russia then, you know, and show them the the you know the the prison camps, and that won't change their mind. He said the only thing that that will change their mind is finally when they're, you know, they're getting their head kicked in. And so that's, that's what I can't really imagine. Like it, because I don't know, maybe it's, I don't want to toot my own horn or anything, but maybe that's what reading all these things at an early age kind of prepared me for is to, to hopefully be able to see it when it comes without, without falling for any of the ideologies because it's very easy to see when, well, first of all, it's very easy to see when someone else does it. Like when you're outside of an ideology, it's very easy to see um, someone else believe it, mm-hmm. hook, line, and sinker, like with no critical mind. And it's kind of like, well, you know, what's going on with them? Of course, for the p- person who actually believes in it, they can't see it. They just think they're right. And everyone thinks they're right, right? So you're in this kind of impossible situation of, Um, you can't possibly prove to that person that they're wrong because I think I'm right, they think they're right, and it's the same from their perspective. But the only thing that will actually change someone's mind who just believes in a a total pseudo-reality, and by believe I mean actually believes in it, believes believes it's true, has no kind of hesitations, reservations, or skepticism about it. Like, I know that whatever I might even consider that I believe, I still have reservations or, or think in probabilistic terms, oh, well, this is probably the case. Like for most things, I leave room for a a margin of doubt and the possibility of being wrong. But when you look at people who have bought into an ideology hook, line, and sinker, it's like they know what the truth is, right? And that's one of the big problems. So this KGB guy identified it and could see it in that context. And <clears throat> we can see the same thing playing out um, currently in various different forms of absolute certitude and, and, um, and 
unshakable belief in the truth about X, even when it can be totally you know, batshit crazy and, and demonstrably wrong. So that is a recipe for disaster. As we were talking about last week in, in James Lindsay's article, he talks about the, you know, why pseudo realities are pseudo realities, why he uses that word. And it's because it has nothing to do with objective reality. And the further you believe something and try to put into practice something that isn't based on reality, the, the harder the, the shock is going to be when you confront actual reality. Mm-hmm. And he had a, a good tweet some weeks ago about, um, in response to someone talking about um, communism and authoritarianism or something like that. And I think part of the background for this tweet, at least for the, for the person he was he was res- responding to was that um, the, the common response when uh, when a criticism is made of let's say Leninism or Stalinism or Maoism or any of the other instantiations of socialism and and communism in the world and it will be whoa well, that wasn't real communism right and we yeah you know, we've heard discussions we have, we've I think we've even had our, our own discussions about it before and his so Lindsay's tweet was um you know replying to something along those lines that well uh, factoring in authoritarianism that communism is a pipe dream that always leads to authoritarianism so it's not that so when you say something isn't really isn't real communism it's because communism is a pipe dream it will never actually happen in the ways in which communist theorists want it to and think it will happen. Because it will never happen, because it is a pseudo-reality, it will inevitably lead to authoritarianism because, because that's the response, that's the, the natural way an, an ideology plays out in reality. Because it, it confronts reality and authoritarianism is the only way to enforce it, and or, the only way to enforce the lie. So... When you, so when you have millions of people believing a lie and even believing a lie that they think is, is good and progressive and will lead to a better future and ideally to a utopia, even though utopias don't exist, then if it's a pseudo-reality, it can never reach a utopia because it's impossible. It, it, it's, not, it's not based in the actual rules of objective reality. And because it will never work, the only way to keep it going is, like I said, to force people to pretend that it will come and to force people to pr- pretend that it's either already here or, or it will be coming. You know, in, in a thousand years, we will have, you know, we, we're on the vanguard and we, we might just have to, we have to sacrifice this generation because our, our, our grandchildren will be living in the, in the communist utopia or whatever utopia. It doesn't have to be communist, but it'll never happen. And the, and the, and that's kind of that's one of the biggest lies about these ideologies is that we just essentially we just have to sacrifice the current generation, um, just put up with it, put up with the the terror and the and the torture and the concentration camps, because um, you know history is more important than us. It's just the playing out of history, and we're like we are we are the the, the self sacrificing um, you know vanguard of the revolution and and. Well, I, I might not be self-sacrificing, but you know, all, all of you peasants that are going to die in all these wars, then and uh, and oppressions. Well, it's f- it's for the greater good. Uh, so then, I like the way that you uh, kind of tied that all in together because it uh, helped to pull some strings together in my own mind as far as you know. Speaking of pseudo realities, well, the COVID narrative is another such example of a pseudo reality where you know hundreds of thousands of billions of trillions of people are dying every second of every minute of every day and we're always on the brink of sheer destruction and terror uh that's a that's a pseudo narrative of a pseudo reality or it's a narrative of a pseudo reality that's not true and so one of the other things that is in that uh narrative is this like you were saying, this the sacrifices that must be made in order for the 
the utopia to come. So what yes. the utopia on their idea is, you know, this realm where we can all like, I'm, I'm still not even sure like what their, the grand ideal who's, is on that. Who's utopia though? In what, in what scenario? Yeah. Um, well, that's a, that's the question then, isn't it? Because there's, I guess you could say like what the populace would consider part of the, the end goal. So I guess like the end goal for a normal person would be to go back to normal. Yeah. Um, I guess that would be, you know, what they think is going on, which kind of gets into the paralogistic nature and the paramoralistic nature of the whole th narrative. Uh, because they're being told these things. You have to go along with these authoritarian dictates. You have to wear your mask. You have to get your shots. You have to do this, that, and the other. All of which we highly recommend. Just saying. <laughs> but but just to drill down a little bit, you, you asked what... You know what is this utopian vision that say the rioters and and far left to use an example have been engaging in and the whole uh pseudo reality that they're engaged with is so subjective in some sense that i can i can partially imagine them having delusions of grandeur about uh acquiring more power in the you know in 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 life and having things bestowed upon them that they feel you know haven't been fairly allocated to them without the requisite work involved in earning it so <clears throat> you can just imagine how <clears throat> a lot of individuals who have gone in that uh, crazed direction have their own um, place in their minds for themselves and where they imagine they should be or or what or what they deserve to have and what that'll look like so there is that um i do want to go back to something that was said a little earlier regarding uh very smart people as lindsay puts it and the resistance involved in questioning the paramorality and the paralogic that so subsumes them into uh, the prevailing ideological um, idea that, that's been uh, brought into being by basically psychopathic or psychopathically indi influenced individuals. And in having a conversation with someone I know recently, I realized that there was such an incredible amount of uh, resistance to information that, that would call into serious question um, their beliefs on certain things that it was, it was impossible to, to make any kind of headway in, in understanding for themselves. Uh, and ideas that are, you know, even patiently and uh, caringly conveyed and expressed and shared there is an incredible amount of resistance to and and i think the reason for this there are a couple of reasons uh one is the idea um that we first heard expressed about 18 or 19 years ago uh out of the mouth of george w bush if if you're not with us then you're with the terrorists basically and so what we're what we're seeing now um, kind of unfold in in real time again is this incredible psychological and emotional pressure that's being brought to bear on individuals who may otherwise question certain ideas and and this this pressure the underlying um, message and threat is if you don't believe in, in these ideas, if you're not taking the side of, for instance, social justice or anti-fascism in the ways that it's being presented right now in the West, then you must be evil and you will be canceled and attacked. Uh, if, however, you can acquiesce and, and submit to these ideas, then your job will be protected, then you will be thought of as a good person uh, because it's only good people who can really see this, uh, right? 
It, you, you have to be evil in order to not see this. So this is an incredible amount of, of, um, of psychological uh, pressure and uh, coercion and manipulation that uh, a lot of very smart people are subject to, but they don't realize that they're being subjected to it. it it's not a, it's it's not a, um, it's not something that they have a, a fair enough distance from psychologically or emotionally to look at and to say, okay, this is how I'm being conned. And the reason I'm being conned is because there are people who are extremely malevolent, who are wearing a kind of um, a shroud of righteousness and goodness uh, that would tear my head off if, if I don't agree with them. Uh, Lindsay has a couple of great passages that uh, explain this a little bit. I'm going to read one. He says, because the paramorality is, in fact, immoral, participants in the pseudo-reality will experience vigorous, usually totalitarian, enforcement of the ideological paramorality. It is in this way that the requisite social pressure is created to maintain the lie and its immoral system. In turn, following the cycle of, of abuse, they will then use the same tenets and tactics to paramoralize normal people outside of it, eventually far more rigorous, vigorously. The trend toward Puritan-style pietism, authoritarianism, and eventually totalitarianism in application of this paramorality is a virtual certainty of acceptance of an ideological pseudo-reality. And these abuses will be visited not only on every participant in the constructed fictional reality, but also to everyone who can be found or placed within its shadow, which can come to include entire nations or peoples, or, in fact, everyone, even those who reject it. Again, this is the true alchemy of the pseudo-realist program. It transforms the normal, moral people into immoral agents who must perpetrate evil to feel good and perceive as evil those who do good. So it's, it's, a, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's rather sophisticated in some ways um, in that the level of manipulation involved, the dynamics that we're bearing witness to, the descriptions that, that Lindsay gives, um, describe something that is, uh, you know, it, it, it's Machiavellian on a, on a manipulative level that I think is difficult to fathom for most people who, uh, who, who may be, who may have been trained or brought up or uh, raised to think of of good and evil in very simplistic terms. Uh, but when it's applied to social movements and political movements, um, there's a, a whole other set of considerations to be had that uh, I think we've been attempting to get at here for the past however many shows. Well, so, well okay. So then bringing that back to you know the question that I asked earlier, um, or I guess maybe Harrison brought it up and I just reiterated the fact that it was a question. Uh, you know, what is the utopian vision? Because we have to define that uh, along the different lines that are at play. So at the bottom rung of it, you know, like I said earlier, there's the normal person who's just wants to, you know, uh, get back to normal. Like that's the only reason they're going along with these things. Mm -hmm. Well, at the top of it, there's... The people who are instituting these things, the people who are warping language and warping morality and warping logic to serve this agenda that they have for their utopian vision. Well, what is the utopian vision of of these uh, psychopathic individuals? Mm -hmm. um, I'll give an attempt at kind of fleshing it out a little bit and then you guys can comment uh, on where you think I'm uh, wrong or you know, could use clarification. Um, it seems that on, well, we'll start off with they want power for the sake of power. 
that's one aspect of it. They want to be able to do whatever they want without repercussions, without responsibility for the ramifications. They want uh, money. They want uh, the, the ability to own everything and everyone even. Uh, they have no qualms about, you know, taking people as slaves and, and doing all kinds of horrible and horrendous things with them, with them or to them. Um, so I guess to further flesh it out in like real terms, I guess you could say what they really want is a technocratic total control system where they can decide who uh, does what, when, where, and why, and with whom. Um, and they can di that, dictate that on whatever whim they have at the moment. Um, and so if that's their utopian vision or utopian dream, is some, some variation on that scheme where, again, they have total control over everything and everyone, uh, that is not what... Well, first of all, do you guys have any like further additions or comments on that? Uh, no, keep, keep going with it. Okay. We'll finish your thought. Um, so that's what they want. Well, the normal person would definitely not want that. He does not want that because that mm -hmm. means that their freedoms are, are being curtailed. That means their ability to do uh, as they see fit, uh, which automatically takes into consideration not wanting to you know, hurt other people. Like A normal person's desires for life are to... like. Uh, accrue some to themselves but also to do so in a way that doesn't destroy uh everything around them you know somebody who just wants to uh say like reach the pinnacle of uh of a mega corporation like they just want to be a ceo you know they have the drive the ambition the ability um you know and that's what they want to do and they can do that and they can do it in a way that doesn't you know lay waste to the corporation or uh, destroy other people's um, uh, careers along this along the journey um, so that's normal and natural and that's you know what normal people are like uh, so for to give these other these path pathologicals uh, the ability to dictate who and what and when and where and why is completely uh, antithetical to their moral values and to their uh, value structures. Um, so it's not something that they would naturally want. So they have to, if the pathocrats want to impose the system on everyone else, well, they have to do something in order to get people mm -hmm. to change their uh, value structures. And that's where the paramoralisms and the paralogical systems, that's where all this all comes into play because it all comes into service of this pathocratic ideal, of this pathological utopia where they would be able to do whatever they want and get all of their needs and wants met as just horribly mm -hmm. depraved as they actually are. Um, and they can't do it with moral people's moral structures, natural moral structures that are based on objective reality and natural human interactions uh, intact. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's this onslaught that you were talking about, Alon, this psychological pressure. All of these different pressures and, and uh, authoritarian structures and, um, and things all go to serve to breaking normal people down mm -hmm. to where they can be manipulated uh, to, you know, become, you know, like you were saying, uh, Harrison, about these very smart people who inadvertently support... Uh, the rise of the totalitarian state. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of like the... Mm -hmm. Well, so I, I think that there... First, I, I think that was a, a good analysis of it. Um, I, would, I would add that the technocracy, uh, the pathocrats, the people at the top, the ones who speak the rhetoric of uh, the ideologies... Uh, the, the ones who send memos down to corporations about putting billboards in their company and changing their policies to reflect uh, diversity and inclusion and tolerance, um, they, you know, they, they are using this ideology. They're, it's being um, instilled and propagated in the minds of, of the masses, basically, into most people. 
with the with the full knowledge that the you know the rank and file soldiers of the, these thoughts and feelings and actions and protests are utterly disposable. Uh, it's it's basically a kind of a lure, um, a hook, a carrot that draws people into the belief in and support of policies that fit into uh, and are sold as progressive, liberal, um, benevolent, uh, when, you know, underneath all of that, just beneath the surface, is a kind of a rotted, corrupted, uh, greedy, um, callous um, will to power and accrual for more power. So there, there are these, you know, various um, kind of levels, I think, to who's influencing whom and, and, and how, it, how it presents um, by, by certain uh, strata of, of, uh, of society. Well, I think that, well, a, a few things. I want to comment on a few things both of you said, maybe in reverse order. I think that a lot of people, even at the, even at the top, are very smart people. They're people who are so smart that they're just dumb. That, um, and because you can see, if you just look at a lot of the very smart people on that tweet, you know, on on Twitter. So the big intellectuals of the day, whether they're like Steven Pinker or it's not the big ones, but some of the big ones like Steven Pinker and Michael Shermer and um, people like that, they're they're so so very smart, and I'd say a lot of them aren't evil people that have evil designs on taking over the planet they just they're they're so inured in the in the in the culture and the and the just going and and going with the flow of of the mainstream that they can't see it so they they're totally behind all these policies um because they they just don't see, i think a lot of them because they see themselves as good people, they can't see themselves supporting the, anything that's bad, and they can't see how this is bad because that would mean that the the people, the the other people, um, propagating these ideas, who are some of whom are their friends, might be evil too. And it's like, and, and we're not like that. We are above that. Um, I read an article recently. Well, it was the article where that with the KGB interview in it. And the author of the article had, had said that, uh, you know, so had asked the question, well, why do intellectuals support this kind of thing? Why, do, why have they always done this? And uh, she quoted, well, she didn't quote, she just referenced um, the British writer Paul Johnson, I think. And he'd concluded that it came down to arrogance and egocentrism. And that's what you see in very smart people. They're, they're very arrogant and very egocentric. And part of that is what Lindsay describes when he talks about about very smart people is one of the, one of the er, one of the aspects of that arrogance is is their open mindedness because scholars academics are open minded in order to understand something <clears throat> it has to be premised on the idea that there's something to understand so they'll go into a new idea with the assumption that there's something to be learned from it that there's an internal logic to it so a lot of them will get into like reading postmodernism for instance because there must be an answer it must actually make sense not realizing that sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Sometimes there's nothing to it. And sometimes when it seems to make sense, it only seems to make sense because some things seem to make sense and it's actually just total BS. Mm -hmm. So, so a lot of these very smart people, they see an idea and they, and this is what Lobachevsky talked about critical correction. They see an idea that's somehow faulty at its root and they, they gloss over the, the errors in it to, to create in their mind what they, what the author must have meant. And what the motivation must have been, and of course they color that. They, they project their own psychology a bit. That oh well, there must there mustn't be any bad um, intentions behind it. So you'll get people totally you know behind the great reset or or whatever's going on, and and ideas about um, you know um, central bank digital currencies and the like total control of 
of the economic system just because they think it's a great idea. Oh, and, and it'll it'll because they genuinely genuinely believe. Oh well, you know, most people do don't do anything wrong. The only people that that are are hiding their financial transactions are doing something bad, anyways. So what's the problem with uh, with total information control? And being able to track every transaction and knowing knowing every transaction that ordinary citizens make, because ordinary citizens, as long as they're not doing anything wrong, then what's the problem, right? We're just gonna we're gonna find money launderers and and terrorists using you know digital currencies to cover up their shady acts. So in their mind, it's like, oh, it, it makes perfect sense. Um, we just want we just want to do good for the world. And that that brings up something that I've kind of thought about uh, about this kind of like total, totalitarian system is that it's not necessarily inherently evil. Mm -hmm. It could be like really beneficial. You know, like some of these people have in their ideas or in their mind, like, yeah, we could catch money launderers. That's great. That's good. Yeah. So there is some aspects of this that are or could be genuinely good and useful and uh, for the benefit of all mankind. But the problem is that they're not taking into consideration who's actually at the board playing with all the control mechanisms mm -hmm. and that's where they go wrong yeah and, that, and that's the problem with very smart people is that if you have very intelligent kind people who are running everything you don't have anything to work about or anything to worry about mm -hmm. right because everything yeah. will go go right because well like me as a very smart person if i was in that that position i'd do all the right things I, i'd make sure that no problems were made so again there's this arrogant projection of of goodwill and competence that doesn't actually exist in reality because that's not the way things play out. When you have totalitarian um, like structures in place, you're not going to get benevolent people at the top of the food chain that are in charge of them. It, it never works out that way. And that's what very smart people don't realize is that very smart pe people are useful idiots. They're the ones that, that make the way for the, the worst of the worst and, and cover for them because they pretty much all out of their own self-image issues it's like i think because it's because of their their arrogance because they are good people they support these good policies they they would never do such a thing and so then that causes them to ignore the the possibility for evil because they wouldn't associate themselves with any of that evil in their own minds even if that's what they're actually doing mm -hmm. um I want to get back to the what is the utopia and something that you said, Ilan, about the the various levels. So I think you gave a pretty good description of what it is what it's like in the most pathological mind that um, that a, the utopia for psychopaths and people like them is that they want total control. They want to be able to do whatever they they want. They want they want everything and to to be to be able to express themselves in the most you know perverse ways possible and i mean perverse on every level and without any repercussions because like we said last week um, people like this psychopaths in particular know that if other people knew what they were actually like they'd be lynched in the streets or put away for life that's the that's the fate of a psychopath when they are exposed and so they know that and they so the political ones want to create a system where they are immune from any of those repercussions mm -hmm. so when they're the ones in charge and then like you said so what what they need most people wouldn't be behind that the vast majority of people would be like ah no thank you it's like i'm not putting ted bundy in in mm -hmm. in charge of my country or the world so what do they need they need a palatable plausible ideology to get behind to to rise to the top with that other people will support and the most and and so communism and um, social justice ideology they are perfect because they now this is the other this is the the the, the pseudo real utopian vision so the the pseudo real utopia for well for both of them in its most simple form is the end of human suffering and that's the way now you can frame that suffering in different contexts, like in you know, for Marx it was in class conflict, but it comes down to it. We we want we just don't want anyone to suffer. So in its in its current clothing in its current uh, variety, the end of all. So we want so a perfect world. The utopia will be the end of all um, inequalities, whether they're 
sexual, gender, um, racial. The perfect world will have all of those eliminated. Never mind the fact that some of the, or a lot of the, the problems and a lot of the ways that they define the problems aren't even real in the first place. Now, this is where we, we get to the, you know, communism is a pipe dream. Well, social justice is a pipe dream in the capital S, capital J, like, you know, Lindsay and, and Helen Pluckrose write in their book. That kind of social justice is also a pipe dream because the actual problems themselves that they're identifying aren't real. They don't actually exist. There's no such thing as systemic racism. Um, there is such thing as racism, but uh, social justice theorists don't actually believe in, in racism. That's not what racism means for them. Um, they're talking about, about something that can't even be identified um, concretely. So when you have a problem that can't even be, even be cured because it doesn't exist, as long as you can convince someone, convince people that it's a problem, then people want to get rid of that problem. So, okay, so now this, this problem exists. Well, you know, we need to get rid of this problem so that the suffering ends, so that people are equal, so that we, so that p people are just treated with common decency and respect. And so people will naturally get on board with that, not realizing that there isn't a problem in the first place and that they're, that the, the actual, they're not actually looking at the actual problems that can be fixed. And so a lot of good natured people, well intentioned people, get behind it because their goals are are normal it's like they they do want good things to happen the thing is that the, the people behind the ideology and the people using the ideology don't want good things to happen it's like that's the whole point is that they they actually want bad things to happen because what's what's good for them is bad for other people again it's like using ted bundy um or, or any serial killer they lie and they manipulate to get what they want which is good for them which is really bad for the people they torture and kill. And that's, that's what happens in, that's why I think it was last week or we mentioned serial killers and why it's good to read accounts of serial killers and uh, like nonfiction about them, because you see how this plays out in a, in a, in a micro dynamic and the, the kinds of lies and manipulations that, uh, that a, a serial killer will put like, like Ted Bundy, you know, famously would pose as having an injury, like, you know, using crutches, like he broke his leg or something to gain the, the sympathy and the support of, of some young woman that he would then, you know, abduct and do horrible things to and kill. And in the, the victim's mind, she just wants to be a good person. And that's what she is being. She's like, Oh, there's someone to help. I really want to help that person. I want to. I want to eliminate suffering in the world. This is one way I can eliminate a little bit of suff, a little bit, of, a little bit of suffering is by helping this person, not realizing that it is, it is that she's being conned, and that it will lead to her eventual destruction. And this is what plays out in the macro scale. We want, you know, the we the the people that believe in social justice um, theory or or the the ideology want all of these bad things to go away. We want good things to come in their place. So let's eliminate all the bad things. Not realizing that they're being conned and that by by wanting to remove remove the bad things, then you it's very easy to say, okay, well what are the bad things? Okay, well here are all the bad things. Mm -hmm. And this is you have to eliminate this and this and that person and that person and that person. Mm -hmm. Oh, didn't you see what that person did? Like, look what they look what they said. Yeah. Look what that person said. Can you believe that they said that? Yeah. They need to be gone, right? Because they're contributing to the problem, the problem that doesn't actually exist. But now, in all these people's minds, there is a problem that does exist. And now, I have the moral force of, well, that person is evil. Well, I have to get rid of evil. I want to create a better world. the The, the way to create a better world is to get rid of these evil people, to eliminate them. And so that's why you're seeing, lately, in the last few weeks all kinds of statements like this uh, in the news on, on Twitter from sometimes very smart people, some from just very dumb people, um, li using those words exactly. Like, we need to eliminate the, the, the threat from essentially yeah. half the American population. It, it's, it's a really incredible bait and switch. You know, you, you talked about uh, presenting these, these problems that are not, really problems and uh, deflecting the attention away from what are some incredibly big problems uh, pointing to one would be 
the amount of uh, war and destabilization and regime change and in you know in institution of coups all around the world by elements of uh, the U.S. government. But it's all for the greater good. It, it that, that's <laughs> for how the it, greater good. It, that's how it's been sold, and now it's even less of a a focus and a and a and a point of contention among those very same people who would otherwise be engaged in bringing more attention to these subjects and to calling out those uh, figures in, in politics, in positions of power that are um, engaging in the wholesale destruction of lives around the world. So what was what was very evident among many in in the early 2000s has almost completely uh, dissipated in awareness uh, among among many in the West, and along those lines, it's fascinating to see uh, the number of people who have such successful resumes in that direction under prior administrations come back into um, prominence, into positions of power where they can resume uh, all of those policies in a more overt and aggressive way. And uh, we're going to see it. (laughs) You know, whatever we saw under uh, Obama or or Bush, uh, we will see again in overdrive. There's a lot of uh, lost time to make up for in the... Um, in the in the uh, aggressive, power uh, hungry behavior of certain people and 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 individuals and institutions that exist to to do what's good for them but bad for very many people. So that's a another development that we're that we're seeing. And and as for you know this um, domestic war on terror, so-called. Um, it reminds me of what you said a few minutes ago, Harrison. You, you mentioned how uh, psychopaths um, would do things to, uh, to, not, to not be subject to the law, to not be vulnerable to the persecution that they deserve for their crimes. And in, in taking this kind of defensive posture, um, and knocking everyone over the head who would, you know, uh, who would even dare question um, the positions and and the policies that we're going to see going forward. Uh, they they've basically knocked eighty million people on their heels, or have attempted to, and and will continue to do, in order to assert themselves on the stage once again. So. Um, this is a uh, this is quite a development that we're that we're watching unfold here, and uh, it's happening very fast, and it's um, it's like a it's like a shadow falling over uh, the West, over and the U.S. in particular. It's um, <clears throat> you know it's kind of like uh, Sauron, you know, farming out all of these orcs and having. Uh, uh, the wizard dig, dig out all of these uh, these orcs from the ground and and create the army um, to to use the Lord of the Rings analogy. It's a racist analogy. You can't <laughs> use it. I know, but I I thought I would indulge myself a little bit. Um, so there's a couple of things that I wanted to say. Uh, first, I wanted to say that it just like really dawned on me as you were explaining earlier, Harrison, about. Uh, what naturally happens to psychopaths in a society, why they hate normal people, why they're afraid of normal people, really. Like, that's why uh, all of these, uh, you know, high-standing, highfalutin, you know, psychos are doing so much to the detriment of normal people. And it's because they know that if they were ever really found out, they'd be dead. They'd be done for. So I just wanted to throw that out there as just kind of, you know, uh, part of the reason for why they have a war on uh, normal humanity. Quick quick interjection, Adam. Uh, Quote from George Bush Sr. 
he once said, you know what I'm going to say, he once said, if the American people knew what we had done, they would run us out in the street and lynch us. And it was an incredible, incredible thing to hear out of the mouth of somebody like him. It's incredibly honest. It's incredibly honest and, and true. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, if you, if you, if you've done a, a little bit of reading into all this, I mean, we've heard a lot about him just on the, on the very surface of, of politics, but he, he was into all manner of things that would make the average citizen, uh, drop their jaws in disbelief. And much earlier in the show, Harrison, you, you mentioned the literature, uh, kind of moving it back into that topic for just a moment literature and fiction that that's helped create the groundwork for understanding the the soil from which to um grow our our comprehension of psychopathy and uh, the systems that it 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 grows and espouses and 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 what that looks and feels like and it reminded me i think you mentioned kafka at one point Kafka's The Trial, a uh, wonderful explication of what a, what a bureaucracy, a pathocracy really, is capable of doing to an individual um, where someone stands accused of something, but of what exactly is, is never clear, only that there is this monumentally oppressive system in place at the, at the company he works for, at the local courthouse, at the higher levels of government that would seek to crush this in- individual. And um, it, it's, it's wonderful in that it puts you in the, in the shoes of uh, in, uh, this character who has to make sense of, of all of these developments in his life and and what he's standing accused for and and just how he's supposed to defend himself in a court where the accusations are not so clear um so domestic terrorism as as it is now being used would seem to be one of those uh, abuses of language that Lindsay describes um that is so broad in scope so as to be almost completely meaningless and and intangible and and appropriated to be used in any way that a particularly pathological system which we're seeing unfold uh sees fit to use it against against individuals who would dare to voice dissent um, so that's the, that's the psychological terror. That's the real terror that we're being faced with. Uh, the chilling effect that is by design, um, being used by the media, by politicians, by the think tanks, by elements of the ABC agencies and the military to scare the shit out of everybody and to disempower and uh, before the end of the show today, we'll, we'll get back, I think, to some of the ideas that Lindsay presents in his piece and also in Rod Dreher's book that we've been uh, discussing some, some weeks ago about what, how we can continue to approach some of these problems. Well, one point I wanted to make is... The, Going back to George Bush's comment and and what you would reiter- reiterated, Adam, about you know why why sicko leaders are doing these kind of things. Well, I think that there's a couple different phenomena to parse out, and one is that a lot of people in power in any country, in any system, can get away with a lot just using the the existing structures. You know, in a in a rel- in a relatively even in a even in a relatively normal country, and that's why that's how pedophiles um, and con men work. So, um, all a pedophile has to do is get a 
socially acceptable and respectable position, and then they can largely do whatever they want. And a lot of them have been. If you become a, a judge, a, you know, a police chief, or um, you know, if you if you run a kids' charity or whatever, that's that's where a lot of these pedophiles get caught, and um, and they've been, or you know, in a, in the in the church or wherever, when they when they finally get get caught, you realize that they've been doing it for years and years and years and getting away with it because they've just managed to, you know, put on a real good show like most like any good psychopath. So. So that doesn't that doesn't necessarily need, uh, or those people don't necessarily need a new social structure. They don't need to be to form their own government. Um, they they're getting by pretty well. And a lot of the people, like I like I'd guess Bush Senior and a lot of the like the, the sickest the sickest of the sick in um, like aristocracies and and ruling positions all over the world. They're probably they probably are and have been comfortable in their position. It's like they, they, they're on some level. They they have a knowledge that people would lynch them in the streets if they knew what they were really like, but they're not scared of it because they've always been in power and you know they they've gotten away with it for so long. So there's no real fear. They they don't really need to change anything. What happens is, um, that would be kind of what I might call like the maybe the, the fish head scenario, like the movie fish head, which was about psychopathy and narcissism. And the, the line was the, the, the fish rots from the head down, I think. So that's the, you got, you have this rot at the top and, um, and that just happens. It's like, you're going to get, you're going to get evil, evil people in positions of power anywhere in any social system. It's just going to happen unless you have some really, um, like a really developed psychological awareness in the in the society to be able to to find these uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, but there's this other phenomenon with this ideology. So now, because that's only uh, the ruling class, like the 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 ruling individuals, are only ever a tiny percentage of the population, right? Now, within the other, like, let's just use the, the common number, like, so you've got the ruling 1%, right? However many it actually is. Out of that 1%, you're going to get a certain number of them who are um, absolutely reprehensible individuals because they've managed to, to game the, the, the social hierarchy in order to get that position to provide the cover for doing really evil things. That's whatever fraction of 1%. Well, there are a lot of equally pathological people in the 99 percent and they want something too and so this is where you get um this is where the advantage of an ideology comes from and the real danger of an ideology because now you have an ideology for all of the all of the just regular psychos and uh, mentally ill people who want to create a new world it's like we want to to because we're not because these these ones are actually at the bottom of the the ladder in some sense, even if it's only in their minds. Like the guys at the top are already at the top. They don't they don't really need they don't really need things to be totally reorganized. The people at the bottom are the ones with the with the resentment, because they think that. Well, they look at the guys at the top and be like, "Well, I want his position. It's like, why why aren't I getting a piece of the pie?" Um, and so. The ideology is what, per, what it does a couple things. It reinforces their own resentment against society because they're not getting what they want and they think they deserve more. And then it provides this, this um, culture wide and, and beyond like this, you know, nowadays it would be worldwide, this worldwide framework in which to operate and the outcome of which will provide them with social justice because social justice for them too is is like we were saying it about power it's like well for me now you know i will be the one on the top you know right now i'm oppressed society society is structured in such a way that that uh it just oppresses me all the time i deserve more than this and so um and this ideology it feeds that pipe dream in their mind well more of like a fever dream that things are so horrible. It's like people, I'm not accepted for who I am. And 
I'm going to crush the people. I'm going to, I'm going to replace and crush the people that have been, um, um, you know, oppressing me for my whole life. And so that's a, that's a great ideology because it can apply to so many people. Anyone who has had anything bad done to them can find a way of identifying the person responsible or the group responsible. And now all of their problems are someone else's fault. And the way the ideology is structured, the practice of the ideology is to um, get revenge and replace those people to, to make the world right. So that's where you get this mishmash of different motivations. You have people who, you know, gen um, relatively normal people who have had bad things happen to them, who have been mistreated and who are, who then, f um, let's say f fall victim to, or well, even that's not a good word, maybe fall um, prey to? F no, fall, fall victim to their own resentments. They mm. allow that to, to be, uh, nursed within them by the ideology and by their new social group. It's like, oh yeah, you, you really have been wronged. It's like, and everything in your life is because of those people. Everything wrong in your life is because of those people. Even if you have a pretty great life, no, your, your life is actually pretty crappy because of those people. So you can, act, you, act, you can actually victimize people who aren't actually victims and who have nothing to complain about. So you can create even more resentment. It's like pseudo resentment, resentment for something that doesn't actually exist. So you have the, you have pseudo resentment for the people like the, you know, upper class white kids and going to college who now all of a sudden think that they're, they've been totally oppressed their entire lives. And, um, uh, then you've got people who actually have some resentments because bad things that have actually happened to them and people have mistreated them. And then you've got the, the pathological group who, who are, um, who are oppressed just because they're sick in the head and, no, and ordinary people don't like them. Now this is, this is kind of like uh, one of the points that I, I heard James Lindsay make is that I think he was he I think he was talking about a study that was done on like some trans activists and how the 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 most vocal and active trans activists are actually the were actually a group of people with a, a word I don't remember describing um, you know their particular condition is that they get they get um, like a male in this position gets sexually aroused by the um, impression that they are actually a fem an attractive female. So the more people that will acknowledge them as an attractive female, the the greater their sexual um, like arousal and pleasure. They, so they get it, it. I guess it's kind of like a paraphilia or whatever, um, you know, as a sexual like a kink, and so. So those are the, the, the guys like that are the ones at the, at the, like uh, on the, on the leading edge of, of fighting for trans rights, not because, not for, um, like uh, a genuine reason. Well, it is a genuine reason, but, uh, <laughs> not for a reason that, that most, most people would get behind. Like, okay, like, here's a person who, who's transgender and, and, um, and like actually, you know, it's not a selfless reason. Right. And so, because a lot of people can get, can and do get behind, you know, transgendered rights, just like gay rights, just like, you know, the, the liberal value that well, everyone should have rights, right? You shouldn't, you shouldn't necessarily be discriminated, discriminated against for reason X or whatever. But these are people with a, a sexual, um, um, fetish, fetish. Yeah. That's the best word. A sexual fetish who are trying to create, uh, a social norm that will then get their sexual fetish not only accepted, but then th them be able to um, fulfill their sexual fetish. That's kind of uh, a good example of how this works. That for the for the pathological end, it's like there are, there are people essentially like serial killers who are basically advocating for you know equal rights because they feel oppressed because they can't serial kill. That's kind of the along the lines of what goes on with with psychopaths in political ideologies. They want different things than the other people in the ideology. Normal people can't realize that and don't realize it. They want normal things. Sometimes they want things that don't exist that they've convinced themselves that they that exist, but the the seriously mentally disturbed people actually want different things. And it might be akin to a sexual fetish. Like, and sometimes it is. Like. Well, I, j just to, 
uh, interject there. I, I think a better example might be how pedophilia in particular has been normalized in the West and how certain <laughs> laws in various places have been um, watered down and... Uh, but have they really? I, I thought I thought there was a law in California that that reduced the uh, the sentence for abusing a minor to like a, a lower age or something, um, and it's it's certainly uh, it's certainly a, an idea that that's been kind of foisted upon uh, the West in in various ways, at least culturally. Um, I know in France that there there were some laws that became or just made it easier for pedophiles to do their thing. Uh, so, so that that just came to yeah. mind as an example of mm -hmm. a sexual psychopathic um, proclivity or or tendency or uh, or desire that is, you know, that only it it would seem people in more normal uh, cultures, healthier societies. Are able to take a look back from and say, "Wait a second! Do you do you realize what you guys are advocating here? Do you see how this is in fact the kind of a sick uh, a way of making permissible what shouldn't even be considered as permissible? That you are giving sick people a kind of a a freer and freer and freer reign uh, towards engaging in in certain." So that would Activity? be more, uh, well then, I guess we could take what you were saying with you know the people at the forefront of fighting for trans rights. Mm -hmm. Then I would venture to guess that the people who are at the forefront of pushing for children's or child sexual rights or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, however the words are actually used, uh, essentially whoever's pushing for, you know, children have a sexuality and should be free to express it in however or whatever way they see fit, I would venture to guess that any of those people who are really pushing hard for it are probably pedophiles mm -hmm. and probably should be locked away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about, I've thought about this pedophile thing a, a few times in the past. That's one thing that I would argue will never be normalized in the sense that anytime a, an actual pedophile is exposed, that's one of those types of people that will get lynched, right? Mm -hmm. It's probably the pedophiles that are, are at the top of the list always have been and probably always will be mm. what's created is is like is there's a what's been created i think is a is a culture that makes it a bit more easy to be a pedophile like even with the even with the um like the cuties movie and all that stuff it's like if there was if there is any actual pedophilia going on again those people will, will or the majority of regular people that you meet on the streets if you meet, if you see a bunch of guys, and well, it happens all over the place. There's there there's usually stories, pretty regularly that come out of Russia about some pedophile getting lynched, but it's the same everywhere. Uh, I think you know maybe not everywhere, but <laughs> but um, but what you have is this again. This it's kind of a, analogous to the very smart people thing. It's like uh, you have movies like Cuties and the the hypersexualization of children. Um, for, and for for more normal people who are just part of the like the the social justice progressive climate, they might just see oh you know it's it's good to see young girls expressing themselves like that and they're they're not pedophiles so mm -hmm. they're they're kind of okay with it maybe it'll make them uncomfortable on some level but they don't want to be paramorally bullied for saying anything about it so they'll go along with it, um, but that in that new environment where there's where the, it, I think it creates just a bit more ease for for pedophiles to operate, and so so yeah, they're going to push it. They'll they'll push for anything that will that will uh, ease the climate for their uh, their manipulations, and the f for well for the the transgender example, um, like the the guys. I, I think one of the points of this article or where, wherever Lindsay was getting his information was that. These guys are the the most vocal and the most w willing. And what what they're actually doing is bullying other people to 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 accept to accept and 
reinforce their own fetish, essentially. So it's not just a matter of let me do whatever I want and don't judge me for it. It's like forcing other people to to then uh, accept it and make it easier for you. Or, well, that's not the best way of putting it. Um, but th there's an aspect of of wanting to and actually um, coercing other people to accept your own um, like mental illness. Well, a, f a few minutes ago, we, you know, we talked about, um, well, let me come at this a different way. So w what we see, what we've seen in the past few, few years with the gender dysphoria, I think plays into uh, some of this conversation because um, children are basically being encouraged to not only question their sexuality and genders, but they're being put on the fast track to getting uh, biologically transformed mm -hmm. into uh, male to female or, or female to male. Um, when, they ha when they're when they hardly developed enough to, to make decisions about what they're gonna eat for dinner. <laughs> and, and the idea that we are empowering uh, children to be who they really are uh, is a is a doing actually a great injustice uh, for children, and also plays into what one of you just said about the idea of children being. I think you said this a moment ago, Adam. Children being um, uh, adult enough or sovereign enough to make decisions for themselves about their about who they're going to have relations with. Um, so, so this, this, this fast tracking, this, uh, imposed kind of, uh, pseudo empowerment of children to make decisions for themselves that are so drastic, that can be so life changing and so detrimental ultimately, uh, to not only their, their bodies, but to their very being. Um, it, it, it's like, it's like the, the, I don't know, a, a, an attempt to destroy a whole generation of, of young people um, who, who need guidance and, and perhaps a, a therapy and, and, and support, but definitely not a, the full-on freedom to, to do things because at such a tender age, they're, you know, they, they might feel a certain way, however strong. Uh, most adults don't know who they are, uh, you know, in some sense or another, or 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 individuated or integrated to such a degree that they that they can clean their room on a regular basis. How how is it that that we have allowed this um, this terrible uh, ideological uh, paradigm to? to infect the minds of kids to, to the extent that it has. I know. No. <laughs> the answer. No, uh, well, I'm, I may know part of the answer. I don't know. Um, there's a few things going on. One is, um, I'm trying to think of an example from either um, like the USSR or, or Mao's China, but basically it relates to what we were talking about regarding ideologies and the, impo the, 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 the pipe dream nature of them and the impossible goals, that when you create something impossible, then, um, then you have to enforce it totally, you know, totalitarian and illy. <laughs> <laughs> and so with, with this, uh, with the thing about like transgender surgeries in, in kids, by first of all amplifying the ideology and getting everyone to believe in or a large percentage of the population to believe in it now you've 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 made your pseudo reality real in some sense and so it's it's now almost impossible to fight well it's not impossible to fight but now it's a lot easier to to bully the people that point anything out about it because it has been normalized that then creates the the paramoral evil now 
The evil is anyone that says, oh, well, it's wrong to do that. When, so a total inversion of reality, it's no longer wrong to, to mutilate and, and, um, and potentially ruin, have a, to, yeah, potentially ruin a child's life and future for what they think they want at the age of seven or something like that, um, or however old they may be, that it's now evil to say that that might be wrong, even though that might be wrong. So you've created your own um, enemy now. And the enemy is any rational, like normal person with common sense who says that might not be a, a good idea. It's like, well, that now you're the person going to the gulag. You've essentially, you've created the evil. You've created a, a paramoral evil to then be able to bully. And you've created an, an enemy, an internal enemy. And that's, that's the way that pathocracies operate is by creating essentially fake enemies. And that puts people in the position of... Um, any normal person uh, of being put in this Kafkaesque reality. It's like where all of a sudden, um, just for having a common sense reaction or opinion about something, now you're on trial and you deny your guilt, and proclaim your innocence, and that is then taken as further evidence of your guilt, right? The Kafka trap. Mm-hmm. So so it, 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 it is the, the, the willful manifestation and and uh yeah manifestation of a pseudo reality that then that creates the framework for a totalitarian crackdown it's like the, there's so many parts that that feed into each other and um like you you have to create this evil you have to create this this system where where normal things become evil good things become evil and evil things become good and that per- puts normal people into this crazy reality where they have no idea what's going on because they can't understand it because they can't understand that that there is this other reality that there are like crazy people who will totally invert reality for the sake of um, destroying other people and accruing power for themselves Mm -hmm. and that it's very disorienting for a lot of people that's why it was totally disorienting for a lot of people in you know in all the countries where communism took root is because it's like now you're you're thrown into this new reality where everything we're up you know everything's upside down and nothing makes sense anymore, and you can be thrown in prison for for no reason and not understand why you're there, not understand the charges against you because the charges themselves might just be made up, or um, you know or totally false, and then you have to try to well you have been determined to be guilty. So when you try to prove your innocence, well well no we we already know you're guilty. It's like, we already have the evidence of your guilt. You've mm-hmm. already been found guilty. Right. And it's like, well, what the hell is going on? I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> That's the position that people are put in, this totally crazy-making um, situation. And that's this is one of the biggest features of what's going on is the 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 mass in induction of mental illness. I think that points to the source of what's going on is, is mental illness to begin with. You have this, um, the, the creation of like functional forms of all kinds of mental illness. So it's being, these things are being amplified and induced in normal people. And you can see all of the main forms of, of like serious and dangerous mental illness, paranoia, uh, hysteria, um, asociality, um, uh, psychopathy, sociopathy. Um, what are some other ones? Um, those are the main ones. I think there's one other one that I that I was thinking about, but pretty much you have these these types of uh, of problems, and then it's like they're being actively created in the population. Mm-hmm. Um, and you you see this, and it's the media that does it. The you know the media and Twitter. It's like it's it's so easy to to amplify and and create mental illness in people, and and. This is this gets back to something that that Jonathan Haidt wrote, wrote about and uh, Lukianoff in Coddling of the American Mind about like trigger warnings, and you see a lot of this in um, in kind of progressive therapy, I guess you could call it, uh, like social justice therapy, where instead of and J- Jordan Peterson talks about this, instead of doing the, what actually works to get rid of like a fear or, of something. Um, you you what what's happening is people are becoming like students for instance in universities and colleges 
um, are being trained to take more offense to things, to be, to be more sensitive, to be more triggered as opposed to exposing them to the thing that triggers them and having, and, and reducing their, their reaction to it, they're becoming more sensitive. So it's like a mass, uh, a mass induction of, of, uh, you know, snowflakery to to use a, a pejorative, but it's happening in, on so many different levels and in so many different ways. And if you read Ponderology, that kind of starts to make sense. It's like, oh, wait a second. You know, people are becoming more asocial, more paranoid, more hysterical, you know, more violent and sociopathic. Mm-hmm. Um, narcissistic. What could, more narcissistic. What, what could that mean? You know? Well, yeah, it's the, when you think about it, or when you think about the, um, the different measures and prescriptions for all of the, you know, this COVID pseudo narrative, pseudo reality, you know, socially distance. So you can't go and see other people. Like, like you were saying, it's one of the things that allows you to overcome a fear is exposure. Like, you know, if uh, Jordan Peterson always gives the, or he gave the example of, you know, someone who's afraid to go in the elevator. Well, the first day they just go and look at the elevator and that's all they can handle. That's great. They've now gone farther than they were before. And then the next one, they just, you know, they push the button and they stand in, do- in the door. And then the next day they walk in. And then the next day they'll actually go up an elevator. And then eventually it gets to the point where they're no longer afraid of the elevator. And it's just, you know, part of their uh, everyday life. Well, now, and so you could you would have that with uh, people of other political opinions and other religions and everything like that. Like at first, mm-hmm. you know, say like during the, beginnings of the war on terror well the muslims were evil and totally bad uh and so you would want to you know isolate yourself from them but really what you would need to do was to go and talk to them Mm -hmm. and then you can realize oh not everyone who is a muslim is a terrorist Mm -hmm. uh and so it's that exposure that that gives people the actual awareness of what things actually are Mm -hmm. And so when you're socially distancing yourself from other people, you're, you're cutting yourself off from interacting with the very people that you need to be interacting with in order to understand, you know, who they actually are. Because if you're a liberal right now, you think every conservative or you're being told to believe whether or not that's actually the case for a lot of these people, you know, at least in the media, they're, they're telling everyone to be afraid of anyone with any conservative bent or any right. conservative leaning. Mm-hmm. They are domestic terrorists. But if you were to actually go and talk to these people, they're very sane. Yeah. And they're, they're just normal. They're normal and moral. You know what that reminds me of, Adam? So uh, there was a, a, a lady, a left-leaning lady, who went to a Trump rally uh, a number of months ago or just a couple of years ago. And she was warned by her friends who, who said, you don't want to do that. These people are crazy. You know, you you really you must take care. Uh, You're to, gonna die to, to not go there. And and she said, "Well, I went, and everyone was quite friendly and nice." And this isn't to say that there aren't some Trump supporters who were who were nutty or or far far right. Some, I'm not saying that at all. But what this woman realized in in doing what you suggest, uh, in acclimating herself to what she's been told to fear was that she was being peddled a lot of BS. Mm-hmm. Um, just wanted to read something, because uh, we're, we're coming at the end of the show here, um, and we, we do like to provide a little hope and advice when, when we're all facing such a shitstorm of a psychological and emotional attack and spiritual attack, um, because we can have this knowledge um, but at the end of the day, we still have to kind of assimilate it for each for ourselves and come to some um, way forward, some approach, some strategy uh, in, in processing all of this. So this is towards the end of uh, Lindsay's essay. He writes, simply refusing to participate in the pseudo-reality utilize its paralogic or bow to its paramorality and to live one's life as though it is utterly irrelevant to yours is a powerful act of defiance against an ideological pseudo-reality. It requires nothing more of a person than a convicted statement that says, 
This does not apply to me because it is not me, or not even real. A refusal to make decisions based in socially constructed fear and intimidation, and a willingness to live one's life on the most normal terms possible. It may not always be possible, but we try and do what we can to live as normally as possible. This is a powerful and peaceful act of defiance that many other normal people, those outside the pseudo-reality, will recognize for strength. And while it may cost you in the short term and in some ways, it will reap rewards in the long term and in others, at least up until the point that the paranormal totalitarian trap is fully strung, is fully sprung on a sufficiently broken and demoralized society. Just keep your head up and refuse to live your life on someone else's psychopathic terms, and you will do much against such budding regimes. Now there's another option he gives. He says, refuting pseudo-reality is harder, as it requires much more specific knowledge along with skill, strength of character, and courage. It also must be done at least by someone if an ideological pseudo-reality has already taken root. Such a pseudo-reality has to be shown to be a false reality, which is to say a pernicious fi fiction to as many people as possible. To do it, its distortions of reality, the contradictions of its paralogic, and the evils and harms of its paramorality must all be exposed and explained as a first step. These objectives require devoting, which is in some sense wasting, a great deal of time and expending a great deal of effort intentionally learning something one knows is false, and therefore, if one is successful, useless. It is also demoralizing to learn, given the psychopathic nature of the material. It's not for the faint of heart, even if all goes well. So basically being the anti-social justice warrior, being a, a, a voice like Lindsay himself, like, um, like Glenn Greenwald, like any number of other uh, journalists and thinkers and, and philosophers who really have their finger on the pulse of, of what we're seeing uh, requires a great deal of, of strength and fortitude and knowledge and insight. And um, so there you have two different ways of going about uh, an approach to offsetting uh, what it is we're seeing. And uh, the interview with Rod Dreher of a month, month and a half ago, Live Not By Lies, also has some wonderful insights about how individuals sought to um, defend themselves and, and live normally during the most trying of, of times post-World War II in Europe. So, And yeah, we'll be uh, definitely discussing more of Dreyer's book and how we can apply uh, some of the knowledge and wisdom uh, from you know, those previous iterations of pathocracies to, uh, to today to you know, keep our sanity, but more than keep our sanity, to uh, live not by lies and you know, make our lives uh, something that's uh, worth living. So on that note, thanks for joining us. And uh, again, we'll be revisiting all these topics because you know, it's the most, most important subject that we could talk about right now. So looking forward to uh, having y'all join us again. Uh, be sure to like and uh, subscribe and uh, hit the little notification bell so that way you guys always know when we're uh, popping up new videos. So y'all take care and we'll see you next time.